All right, all right, all right. No, I'm not Matthew McConaughey. Welcome to, let's see, this is season three. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is not starting out very good. <clears throat> or very well. Um, season three, episode three of Grab Bag. And I've changed the background a little bit to give some variety. I'm over here like in a little corner of our dining area. I've closed the curtains to minimize the backlight. And I'm kind of cattywonker, as they say, sideways, because I want you to see the painting that is behind me. That painting was done by NCC's very own Arlene Blamick. And I hope if she hears this, she doesn't mind me saying that uh, a matriarch of the faith. Um, she has just shown Christ through her entire life, through her married life with Joe. They served the church. And now uh, she just is a, a great, caring, wonderful woman with a, such talent. And I was at the house one time visiting Joe and her. And I commented, because I love lighthouses, about how beautiful her painting was. She surprised me. A uh, year or two later, she graced me with a gift. And so I like to show it off <laughs> because it is just a, a beautiful, beautiful painting. Okay, this is going to get longer if I keep talking. Well, this is season three, episode three. Yeah, episode three. <laughs> oh, my. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at John chapter 11. I have four sessions left of this six session series. And I was going to use three of those for John chapter 11, and I'm still going to do that. I'm going to divide John chapter 11 into three sections. And I was going to do something different the last section, but I decided that we're just going to follow up and follow through, even going a little bit into John chapter 12. The reason I tell you that is because I want to encourage you. I mean, that's we're talking four sessions, so that's at least four Sundays. In that time, as often as you can, will you do yourself a favor and read John chapter 11 in its entirety, and even John chapter 12, because we don't want to get so much into the trees that we miss the forest. And when you read the chapter in its entirety, it gives you more of a helicopter view. And so when we dive in and look at particulars, it helps to provide a context for you. Okay, so um that's the plan at this point moving forward and i hope that you will indeed read john chapter 11 and chapter 12. so we're going to begin with john chapter 11 verse 1 but actually not with verse 1 because in order to get a little bit of context we've got to go back into john chapter 10. and this is what we read Jesus is speaking. Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I in the father. And again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Okay, so they're really upset at Jesus because he's talking about being the son of God, and they come after him. The Bible doesn't describe how, but he escapes their grasp. So in verse 40 of chapter 10, Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days, and there he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed the sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Now, verse 1 of chapter 11. A man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. That hasn't happened yet. That is what you will read at the beginning of John chapter 12. And we'll talk about that in session number four. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So Jesus had a, a very tight relationship 
with Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And they knew that. They knew that Jesus uh, cared about Lazarus. And so they sent a message, he's sick. Now understand this, that Bethany is approximately two miles on the southeast slope of Jerusalem on the road to Jericho. Present day, Bethany is sometimes called Azareya. If you, you can understand this if you listen to it, Azareya. It's, it, it literally means the place of Lazarus. So it's not Lazareya, but you can see Lazareya, the place of Lazarus. Luke mentions Bethany when he's writing about Jesus' ascension. This is what Luke wrote in chapter 24 of his gospel. When Jesus had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Now that would have been about a two mile walk back home. So Jesus has led them two miles out and they're gonna to have to go two miles back. Of course, Jesus is not with them. He ascends into heaveny. Heaveny. <laughs> oh, Rob, Rob, Rob. Um, he ascends into heaven. But Luke says, Bethany, and that's why I said heaveny, I was reading ahead. Uh, Bethany was the hometown of Lazarus and who, his two sisters who were mentioned in verse one. Okay, so Jesus is under fire. They're trying to get a hold of him. Um, actually, his crucifixion is not very far away. And he escapes. He goes across the Jordan to a place where John had been baptizing. A message is sent. The one you love is sick. Now, they crossed over the Jordan in the Judean desert that's southeast of Jerusalem. As we said, where John... I mean, we call him John the Baptist. Jesus called him cuz, because uh, uh, John was his cousin. And John had been baptizing. And I believe that it's also the same place that Jesus himself had been baptized. Probably the location was near Jericho, which itself was 15 miles from Jerusalem. So we can probably conclude that Jesus and his disciples were about 13 miles from Bethany because Bethany is two miles from Jerusalem and Jericho is 15 miles from Jerusalem. And I'm a math whiz. Yes, I am. And uh, word reaches Jesus 13 miles, 15 miles away that Lazarus is sick. Now, you got to understand, of course, communication back then. They didn't have the phone. They didn't have texting. You know, it, word traveled by word of mouth. So there are two things to consider here. First of all, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, that's, that's the road that Jesus was speaking about, by the way, when he told the parable of the Good Samaritan. He said a man went down, because he literally went down, from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jericho was below sea level. Jerusalem was on a mount. Jericho was below sea level. Jericho literally means city of palms. So it was kind of a balmy down there in uh, Jericho or palmy down there in Jericho. But it was a main trade route. And so when Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, people would think, oh yeah, that's, that's normal. Somebody would go from Jerusalem to Jericho because it's a very main trade route. And so they would then be, of course, fresh fruit for the picking for thieves. Now that's the story of the Good Samaritan. But you can understand this, it's a main trade route. So Jesus has gone down to Jericho. How did news travel back then? Well, a lot of news traveled by word of mouth from people who were involved in trading, going from one city to another city, and they carried the news along with them. Now, we're going to find out later on that Martha and Mary and Lazarus, they were probably pretty well off. And so they would have the means, if they wanted to, to hire even a 
specific messenger and send the message to Jesus. And that messenger would go down the road to Jericho, and then wherever Jesus was in the area, he would take the message. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention about communication here is that how would they know where Jesus was? Well, <laughs> Jesus was not an unknown figure. I mean, scripture over and over again is talking about, in fact, John even mentioned it here, that many people came out to Jesus. There were people coming, you know, ready for miracles. Or there were people who were coming just to see the show. There were people who coming who were sincere and wanted to learn. People were streaming to Jesus. And so if they wanted to get a message to Jesus, they could very easily do it by private messenger down the road to Jericho, knowing where Jesus was and taking the message to Jesus. Verse three, the sister sent word to Jesus, the Lord, one, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, when he heard this, John writes, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory, so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, and then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Jesus said that Lazarus's sickness would not end in death. Did he lie? I mean, Lazarus died. Well, no. He didn't lie because Jesus, you see, is in resurrection mode, so to speak. This is a miracle in motion long before Jesus even heard the news of Lazarus' sickness. He was aware of the miracle about to occur. So when the disciples and he hear the news, Jesus adds a footnote, so to speak, to the message that he received. And he says, this sickness will not end in death. In fact, it's actually a means to a different end. It's for the glory of God, and it's to affirm the divinity of me, to let people know that I really am the Son of God. Verse 4, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So here's what I see, if you're interested. Jesus is at the location of his baptism where the Father had spoken those words, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit gave affirmation to that statement, as though God needed affirmation or needed his word affirmed, but the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove, endorsing who Jesus was who God had just said that he was. And so from that baptism location, Jesus went into the desert, according to Matthew chapter 4, he went into the Judean desert to be confronted by and to defeat Satan. Now here, this time, he will again leave that location. He will go not into, but through the Judean desert to Bethany for one purpose, and that is to defeat Satan once again by raising Lazarus from the dead. And he knows that. So he hasn't lied. He knows why he's going, but it's going to seem a little bit cryptic to the disciples. But John writes that Jesus purposely waited two days before going to Bethany. Now, when we get to Bethany, we're going to find out, Jesus says, show me where you laid Lazarus. And the sister is going to say, well, Lord, he's been in the tomb for four days. So Lazarus is dead. And Jesus is going to tell them that. And now, and he waits two days. And it's probably going to take at least two days for him to get uh, to Bethany. So that's four days the four days that Lazarus had died, had been prepared for burial, 
and then put into the tomb. Four to five days there for all of that to happen. So Jesus said to his disciples, well, let's go back to Judea. We waited, he waited two days. So he says, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews were tried, had tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? And that's why I read that portion from John chapter 10 to set the context. They were out to get Jesus. And so the disciples remind them, why are we, why are we doing this? You know, they were wanting to kill you, and now you want to go back? So Jesus tells them it's time to pack up for the journey. And of course, they would naturally have concern for returning to territory where Jesus has a kill order on his head. I mean, you know, it'd be easy for him to say, hey, why don't we just hang out here for a while? After all, Jesus, who walks deliberately into the jaws of the lion? Rabbi, they use the term of student to teacher. I think that's important here. Rabbi, they say, they wanted to kill you, and now you're going back? They, they probably didn't say it, but you can almost hear the next phrase being, are you crazy? And in verse 9, Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. Now, here is a teachable moment that Jesus grasps. Here is a lesson that deserves our attention as much as it did the attention of the disciples. You see, they called Jesus rabbi, which meant teacher. They are disciples. They follow Jesus, the rabbi, in order to learn from him. And so now Jesus is going to teach. I, I want to repeat what, what the scripture says. Jesus said, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. You know, at face value, what Jesus says to the disciples would give him the label of Mr. Obvious. I mean, it would it might draw from the back of the disciple group and all of those others who were around when Jesus was talking, a kind of a no joke. We know that. You know, when people walk in the day, they don't stumble because they have the light. At night, they stumble because they don't have light. And they're in darkness. So we know that. But when you put these statements in the context of an answer to the question of why Jesus wants to travel to Bethany, where big men with big rocks want to kill him with their pitching arms, the answer doesn't seem to fit the question. Why do you want to return to hostile territory, Jesus? Well, when men walk in the day, they don't stumble, but when they walk at night, they do stumble. Huh? That answer doesn't seem to fit the question, unless, <laughs> Unless, instead of asking, what did Jesus say, we ask the question, what did Jesus mean? He's a teacher. He's the rabbi. He's wanting the disciples to think. And so he's teaching them a lesson. Jesus is using the facts about light and night to teach a spiritual lesson about himself. It's one he had already taught and that John had recorded in 8, 12. In, in, I, I always had hesitate saying he recorded in chapter 8, verse 12, because at the time he wrote it, there were no chapters and verses, but we'll go with that. In chapter 8, verse 12, we read, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, there's that conversation about light and darkness and following him and walking in the light. Did the disciples get the connection? How much did they remember? I don't know. But a good teacher always circles around 
and reteaches or endorses a lesson. Now, the NIV, for some reason, ends verse 10 with the words, for they have no light. However, the New American Standard Version, which I prefer overall, says this or records this. But if anyone walks during the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And the English Standard Version is the same. There is no light in him. Again, the NIV says, because um, for they have no light. But the New American Standard, the uh, English Standard Version say, there is no light in him. Now the literal Greek translation is this. He stumbles because the light is not in him. I don't know why the NIV does not include that last phrase about having no light within. The light is not in. You know, the NIV just simply says, because they have no light. But the scripture specifically says they have no light in them. No light within. And so I see that as being a very crucial and essential phrase that turns Jesus' statement from a recitation of facts about walking in the day being better than walking at night and turns it into a spiritual lesson about walking safely through this life by a guiding light within. And that light, of course, is Jesus. Do, do you see that? I hope so. I hope I haven't confused you. You see, the disciples are afraid about returning to a hostile environment where Jesus has been threatened with death. Jesus could have said, now, boys, just don't worry. But discipleship is about learning to think like Jesus. And so Jesus takes a normal, everyday lesson about when it is physically safe to walk and uses this to teach a spiritual lesson about when it is safe to walk. Spiritually speaking, it is safe to walk anywhere when the light of Christ leads within. You walk in the day because you can see. At night, you stumble because you can't see. In life, with faith, when we walk in the light of Christ, we don't stumble because we can see. But you will stumble if you don't have the light within, the light of Christ. Jesus won't always be there physically to lead these disciples. And they are the ones who have to in a sense, give birth to the church. And so they need to understand he is the light that came into the darkness of this world to provide a light that will lead them from within, particularly through the Holy Spirit who was yet to come. Now, maybe this will help add a little clarity. I hope so, if you're confused. In chapter 12, our next chapter, in verse 35, John wrote, Jesus said to them, for a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that darkness will not overtake you. So Jesus is anticipating his upcoming death, and he describes himself as the light that is with, with them just a little while longer. Jesus is the light for walking through the darkness of this world. John began his gospel, John chapter 1, by contrasting light and darkness with these thoughts. In Christ was light, and there was no darkness in him. He came to his own, but his own, John writes in that first chapter, did not, number one, grasp the light, number two, they didn't recognize the light, and number three, they didn't accept the light. Why? Because men love darkness rather than light. Jesus is the light. It is a concept with which the disciples are very familiar, or they should have been by then. 
So hopefully they understood, and I hope that you understand that Jesus' lesson about walking without fear, if the light Jesus is with them, physically or within. Okay, let me restate that. Hopefully we understand that Jesus' lesson, just with these two sentences, is about walking without fear. Because Jesus, the light, is with them within. They will need that confidence in ministry later after Jesus returns to the Father in heaven and is no longer with them physically. Now for now, now for now, for now, they can even walk physically with Jesus and not be afraid because Jesus is with them. And that's part of the lesson he's teaching. But he's also teaching that when I'm gone, if you have me, if you, you know, if you have my light in you, then still you can walk through the darkness of this world without being afraid. Here in verses 9 and 10, Jesus introduces a spiritual lesson by using a physical illustration. And I'll just, <laughs> you just kind of, again, men see best when walking in the light, but they stumble when they're in the dark without the light. In the same way, spiritually, men can walk confidently and without fear because Jesus, the light, is with them. But men will stumble like the blind leading the blind if they ignore the light of truth, if they ignore the light of Jesus because there is no light in them, okay? I tried to say that like three different ways, which is a habit a lot of preachers have, but I hope I didn't confuse you. I hope you understand that that's what Jesus was doing. He was teaching them. It's not just what he said, it's what he meant. Here is a big picture truth the disciples would see more clearly in retrospect, in retrospect, but not in the fear of the moment. You know, that what Jesus is saying now, they may not comprehend exactly what all he's saying, and I don't think they did because of what Thomas's eventual response is to Jesus. But in retrospect, as the Holy Spirit is bringing these things back to them, and as they are learning, they will begin to comprehend what Jesus is teaching. We have the advantage, you know, John chapter 8, John 11, John 12, and we can put these links together like Lego blocks. They're, you know, they're, they're in real time. <laughs> and so as the Holy Spirit leads them after Jesus ascends to heaven, they're going to be more able to go back and to communicate with each other and to put these things together and to understand what Jesus is teaching. I got to go on. Um, so Jesus came with a heavenly purpose for a time frame determined by God and not the rulers of men. In the fullness of time, in Galatians 4.4, 4, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. <clears throat> so Paul is saying, God has a plan. God has a timetable. And when the time was right, God sent his son. So the truth is this, the father of light alone calls the shots. Jesus is on God's timetable and is assuring the disciples that they all can proceed confidently to Bethany and not be afraid. Why? Because they are in what Jesus called the 12 hours of daylight, and the light is with them. He is there physically with them. The, the enemies of Jesus, the men stumbling in darkness without the light of life, will not alter God's agenda by threat or by force. They are led by Satan, their puppeteer. But not even Satan can push God in working his purpose outside of his own time frame. You know, they can threaten Jesus, they can try to grab him, but, you know, Jesus is on God's timetable, and these people and Satan are not going to force God's hand. 
in chapter 8, John penned this conclusion after Jesus endured a rough confrontation by his enemies. John wrote, no one seized him, listen, because his hour had not yet come. For them, it was time to grab Jesus, but on God's timetable, no. And so they couldn't seize him. God is in control. God was controlling the timetable and always has. Therefore, as then, so in this present context in which we live, there was no cause for fear, there is no cause for fear or concern in our lives. And it was also the same in the context for the disciples as Jesus was heading to Bethany. They could return to Bethany without fear or concern. Jesus' between the lines spiritual lesson in verses 9 and 10 was simply this, have no fear, I am the light, you can trust me and walk with me anywhere, even to Bethany. Okay, we got to move on. In verse 11, we read this. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. After this spiritual lesson in verses 9 and 10 is expressed, Jesus tells the group, our friend, and there are three prominent words in the Greek for um, friendship or for love. And one of them is phileo. And Jesus uses, we get our, word, our, name, our city name, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Jesus calls Lazarus our philos. He is our friend in the brotherly sense. The one we love as a brother has fallen asleep. And here I would refer us to the previous grab bag where we discussed the biblical view of death as falling asleep in death. And here, Jesus is using that same uh, picture language that he's calling, he says, Lazarus has fallen asleep. Death is falling asleep, spiritually speaking, when you are in the Lord. And Jesus continues the use of the metaphor by stating, so we're going to go to Bethany, and I'm going to wake him up. <laughs> now, you know, what are they hearing? Well, in verse 12, the disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. But in verse 13, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. Now, remember, John is writing this. John is one of the disciples. He's right there. So he's attesting to the truth. We all thought that Jesus was talking about he fell asleep physically, and he's going to go and kind of shake him and wake him up. And so they say to Jesus, if he's sleeping, you know, then let him sleep. Because even today, we know that sleep is beneficial for getting over sickness. And so John, writing now, knowing the ending of the story as you and I do, can look back with 2020 hindsight and tell his readers that Jesus and the disciples were speaking the same language, but they had different meanings. Because Jesus was speaking about death and resurrection, sleep and waking up, death and resurrection. They were thinking natural sleep and just waking up. But things were going to be different. And so in verse 14, they told or then he told them, Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Jesus tells the disciples the truth of what they fail to comprehend, that Lazarus is dead. John even states that Jesus had to state it plainly. <laughs> You know, that John uses that language. Jesus stated plainly, it's kind of like, duh, Lazarus is dead. Now, where do you think Jesus got that information? Now, if you think another group came 
down the road and gave him that information? No. You see, Jesus is in touch with the Heavenly Father. Jesus is man, but Jesus is also God. And so Jesus has, if you might say, insider information. And Jesus then states that he was glad that he wasn't there since what was to come would benefit the disciples' faith when the miracle about to come would become another stone in their foundation of trust and belief in him as the Son of God. I think it's interesting that Jesus says, I'm glad I was not there. <laughs> Why do you think he said that? I'm giving you time to think. Why do you think Jesus said that? Well, Lazarus is dead. We're going to go wake him up. But, and I'm glad I wasn't there. Seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? But knowing how much Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters, knowing how Jesus hurt so deeply that he was going to weep at Lazarus's tomb, I think Jesus is telling the disciples that if he had been there with the Lazarus family, he would have perhaps had overflowing compassion enough to have healed Lazarus right there. I don't know if that's true. You know, it's open to speculation and it's kind of like what I'm thinking. And here's another thought to kind of muddy the waters on that thinking. Jesus proved that he could heal people from a distance. You know, Jesus didn't have to be in a location. There was a rich man who came to Jesus and said, my servant, you know, a, a godly man is sick. Why don't you come back and heal? And Jesus said, just go on home. He's healed. Jesus could heal people from a distance. So why did he not heal Lazarus from where he was? In fact, why did he even bother to return to Bethany and walk into the lion's den of his enemies? You know, like us, the disciples had some faith lessons to learn. And some of those lessons were better learned up close and personal. And remember, Jesus said, this is going to be for the glorification of my father and the glorification of me to endorse that I am the Son of God. That's the whole purpose of this resurrection that's coming up. And it will hopefully boost the faith of the disciples when Jesus himself is placed in a tomb. And so, yeah, Jesus could have healed them from far away. Jesus says, I'm glad I wasn't there. But the whole purpose is wrapped up in the ultimate glorification of God and the affirmation of who Jesus is as the Son of God. Well, in verse 16, Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, <laughs> I see him perhaps doing that. Well, let us also go that we may die with him. Uh, that's nice English. You know, but in modern vernacular, maybe Thomas would have said, <laughs> guys, let's just go and <laughs> let's get it over with him. John tells us the verbal resolution of Thomas. And did the others feel that way? Well, they went. I don't know if Thomas spoke for the whole group, but Thomas is skeptic and He's the cynical one, and so he says, well, let's just go with him, and, and we'll all die. <laughs> what an attitude. Well, no arguments are recorded against Thomas. Was peer pressure at work? Were they all fatalistic? Did they think the threat was not so bad? Did they think that they could sneak in and out of Bethany? And no one would know? Well, not hardly. Jesus always had a crowd no matter where he went. 
Lazarus was a friend to all of them. So perhaps they wanted to just take the chance and pay their last respects. Or had they learned to trust Jesus? After all the time that they spent with him, nearly three years, had they learned to trust Jesus, had they gained spiritual courage that, would, that had come alive in them for a while? Or after all the miracles they had witnessed, were they intrigued by Jesus saying he was going to wake Lazarus from a dead sleep and that they would have lessons to learn? I mean, this, is, this would not be the first resurrection that Jesus, in fact, <laughs> I've always told people that when Jesus went to a funeral, it didn't stay a funeral. You know, when Jesus showed up, people got resurrected like the little boy in the town of Nain. And that's what's going to happen here when Jesus gets to Bethany. And Jesus had done so many other miracles. So did they really have enough faith in Jesus? It, it doesn't sound like, at least from Thomas' perspective, that they were spiritually courageous, kind of like, okay, well, let's all go die. And maybe this miracle would change that attitude. Maybe this miracle would accomplish its purpose to glorify God and to affirm in their eyes who Jesus was. Well, all we know is that Jesus led the way back to Bethany and the funeral of Lazarus. And so three fast lessons. Number one, following Christ always takes faith and courage. Number two, God's delays have purpose. And the purpose ultimately glorifies God. God's delays, when you are asking and seeking God, praying for God, praying for something from God, if God delays, you can be, you can be absolutely sure that there is a purpose. God always has a purpose. He has a purpose in our lives as far as where he's leading, why he's delaying, or why he's saying no. You're not just left hung out to dry. God has not abandoned you. So that's my quick lesson there. God's delays have purpose, and the purpose ultimately glorifies God. Lesson number three, for Christians, no sickness ends in death. You know, did Jesus lie? This sickness does not end in death? Well, no, he didn't, because he knew a miracle was going to happen. He would bring Lazarus back to life. But the truth is that for all Christians, no sickness ends in death. Well, physical death, but not in the death that really matters, spiritual death. There is spiritual life, and that is what matters most to Jesus. Now, I said three lessons. Here's a fourth one. The darkness surrounds us. But Jesus is the light of life and our Savior. And so we can walk without fear, for God has his timetable, and you and I are on it or in it. God is in control. So let's walk in the light of grace and the light of his leading. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. Like using a flashlight at night, you may only see so far, but within that light, you can walk confidently and without fear. Jesus is our light. We don't see all the way down the road. Oh, we all see the ultimate end because our hope in heaven is assured. But every step in between now and then, it's not lit up for us. But still, Jesus is the lamp to our feet, a light to our path. He leads the way. And so let's walk boldly in grace. Okay? I hope that this has been encouragement to you. You can always go back and watch it again if something was confusing. Or you can even get email me or give me a call. And if, if I can, I'll do my best to help explain things a little better. I wanted you to see that picture 
because I so much appreciate the talent that Arlene Blamick has. But maybe it's very appropriate for this lesson. I didn't plan it this way, but it is very appropriate for our lesson, isn't it? Jesus is the light. He's the lighthouse. And he'll keep us from crashing into the rocks. He will lead us safely home. God bless you, brothers and sisters.